that I, and I know I appreciate you being here and I apologize. So Steve, can you very quickly, once again, tell me how you got started and how ocean reef aquaculture got started? Okay. So, so we've been, um, uh, it's been an entity as ocean reef for about 15 years. Um, my myself, I started, I've had been diving and collecting marine animals for since the seventies. Um, so I got into doing a bit of clownfish breeding before it was popular, before Nemo, um, things like that. And when I moved to Victoria, I actually came down here to take up a, a position within the fire service here 20, in 1999. Um, and obviously sea dragons are local and I just got interested and met Pang, who I'm sure a lot of people know. And from there, we started breeding animals and collecting wild stock and um, we got in with the local aquarium here and we started collecting larger livestock and that sort of opened up another branch of what we did. And so we now have permits to collect a wide range of local animals, um, licenses in Queensland to collect animals up there. And we have permits um, to collect broodstock, weedy and leafy sea dragons and some species of local seahorse and pikefish. Um, and we are working on the pipefish and the local, we've, We've had quite good success with river sets this year um, and also the local species of pipefish. We've managed, we've got four little ones out growing out at the moment, um, which when they were born, we didn't, we really didn't know how they were going to survive because they were so small. Um, and the river sets, uh, we've got 52, I think at the moment, around 52. Um, and um, we'll keep the majority of those as brood stock for breeding because they've got to be F2 to export. Um, so yeah, that's about it really. Okay, and you said that they have to be F2 to, um, to export. And uh, anything that he said um, during the silent period at the beginning, guys, I will make sure to edit so that you do get the information you talked about, um, so the videos yeah. and stuff. Um, that's just yeah. seahorses. So anything that's CITES listed okay. um, in Australia has to be F2. Okay, and um, you had mentioned also that you're one of two that have the permits to collect like the sea dragons and such, right? Yeah, so um, here in Victoria, um, I'm allowed four dragons per year for brood stock, okay. um, which includes taking off uh, gravid males. Um, now, dragons aren't CITES listed, so we don't have to get them through to F2, so we're free to sell um, the animals we take. This year, we've got like a 50-50 split. We've got a 50, sort of 50% 50 from what we've bred in-house, and the other 50% are from the wild. Um, we just, um, because of COVID sale and, the, and we mainly deal with public aquariums, we're holding a lot of animals that are uh, over a year old at the moment. Um, like I said, we're holding, I think it's about 430 in total at the moment um, from one month old through to about 16 months old. And then we've got a, uh, our broodstock tanks um, in the factory next door here, which I'll show you later, which is the tank, the animals that we have from the wild, a combination of animals we have from the wild and a combination of animals that we've kept over the years for breeding purposes. And so um, many, so many people make it sound like, it, um, like you know, I didn't even know that people were able to breed the sea dragons. How long have you been successful at the actual um, breeding? We, look, we, it's not a hundred percent. We yeah. don't have success every year. Um, and that's one of the goals is to have, um, continuity from year to year. Um, so it's still an evolving um, thing. I mean, a lot of public facilities have had success. Um, there's a chap in the UK uh, who is getting airdrops from Wheaties that was that he bought via De Jong Marine Life a couple of years ago. And Deborah, who I'm sure you know in the UK, mm -hmm. um, I mean, a fantastic setup. Um, and we converse quite regularly and I'm sure that she will have success in the future um, because her animals are looking particularly healthy. Um, so I think it's just, a, it's like any animal, um, there's something that perhaps we're missing. Um, we've had the only successful egg transfer of leafies in captivity. Um, unfortunately, the eggs weren't viable, but it's a step in the right direction. Absolutely. Um, so we'll just keep plugging away at it and uh, for myself, my personal goal before I sort of get out of this game would, would be to have a um, repeatable success with leafies in captivity. Yes. Um, so, yeah. We all have fingers crossed for you. Absolutely. We want you to mm. succeed. And yeah. and um, so 
when you mentioned, in case anybody doesn't know just by you saying that, what do you mean by um, uh, collecting gravid males? How does that work? Do you, well, you said you can keep so, them. Um, I'm sure, you know, people on here are fairly well-versed in zygnitids, and we know that most zygnitids, the male carries the egg. So yes. in um, the uh, realm of sea dragons, the male carries the eggs. So we look, go out and we dive and we look for males that are at a certain stage and um, which is generally towards the end of the, the pregnancy. And uh, we, we capture them in a special way, um, which is within 20 kilometers of our facility. We bring them back here and we raise the young, um, which will sell you. We've got over 200 young at the moment in one of our tanks. Um, and yeah. Are they are they difficult to find, or do do the restrictions uh, like you no, only be able to I take mean, four? The, in some areas, we're in here in Victoria. It's called a common sea dragon, the weedy sea dragon. Um, a lot of people have a bit of um, uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, misconceptions that the animal is extremely rare. Mm -hmm. um it's not that rare you just got to know where to look and how to look um and i mean we've regularly seen up to 30 40 dragons in one dive um we go a bit further offshore and um we go to one particular place to get them um where it's quite shallow because the dragons do suffer from if they're deep and bring them up can be problematic um mm -hmm. so and we are hoping it's still very much in the planning stages and it's a bit of toing and froing. Uh, we're working with one of the vets uh, that we may actually introduce some of the animals back to the wild. Um, there'll be a very long quarantine process before that happens. They'll be separated from the other animals. Um, I, mean, think, I mean, this is just an idea at the moment. We're still talking to the local fisheries here. The initial meeting didn't go that well, um, but I think they were a little bit, um, hesitant about that but hopefully through talking we work very closely with uh, Rob Jones who's a very well-known vet within the aquarium industry here in Australia and internationally and hopefully with, so that's something else we might work towards uh, is to introducing and another thought we had is in Sydney they are saying that they are having problems is that we perhaps because we do have quite good success in the region of 95 percent survival uh, that we maybe take a couple of animals from up that way. We separate them out completely and raise them to six months and then reintroduce them. I mean, again, these are only ideas at the moment. Um, it's just perhaps a way of help, helping the, the wild population and um, doing something conservation wise in the, in the process. Well, right. Yeah. And you're breeding them. So, I mean, you're already helping in general because the ones you supply mm. are bred mostly. Yeah. Um, so yeah. which, which is uh, more difficult, the weedy or the leafy? Um, they all have their challenges. Um, the weedy we've got down pretty well packed now because we've been doing it for a long time. Um, the first couple of years with the leafies, we um, were problematic um, and there's no literature to go to, so there's very limited talk uh, or very limited information to get. So a lot of what we um, find out is anecdotal. Um, we find out ourselves. Um, up until late last year, I did have a guy called Nick Kirby working for me who was very experienced. Um, he used to work at the Aquarium of Western Australia and he was the curator here at the Melbourne Aquarium for a number of years. Um, he has since moved to Sydney. Um, he has um, got a new life up there after COVID because that's where his partner was living and during COVID because of not being able to travel, um, people attending to spend time together. So um, I have a new girl who started who's very good. Um, but yeah, but we've, we've, we've worked along the way, but I think the leafies are a little bit more problematic in that they have very specific requirements. Um, we do have some little secrets that I will keep to myself because sure. it's just you know, we've worked very hard and um, to get where we are. Um, but suffice to say, the last time we bred leafies, we got out 110 um, to sell. And um, I was planning on keeping a few for myself, but um, basically to keep the company going, we had to sell all the animals um, except the broodstock animals. Um, and um, 
because yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, I've still got to pay my power, I've still got to pay wages, um, right. et cetera, et cetera. So it's just, it was just a matter of need, unfortunately. Sure. But we're looking to collect leafies again this year, hopefully in September or October. And um, I, I jump around a little bit, as I told you, we're very casual, but you, um, it's awesome that you're breeding them and you at work typically with the public aquariums. And so I just wondered, because there are a lot of individuals that are interested in keeping sea dragons. Do you think that's a viable option? Oh, oh look, yeah, more than, yeah. I mean, like, like we talked about Deborah before um, yeah. and Colby, who's now given his dragons to Alicia. Yeah. Um, so look, I mean, as long as you're prepared to do your homework, um, realize that um, the animals have very specific needs, check the availability. I mean, we've, um, this year particularly, we've started training a lot of our animals onto pros and, and they're actually, they're like little puppy dogs. We'll, we'll feed them later and, you'll, and hopefully if we get the thing right, you'll be able to see them come up and eat. Um, they sit there and just look at you waiting for their food. Um, so they are quite easy. They're not too bad to train onto frozen. There are the odd animals that will not take frozen, um, but in general, in general, they will take it. So, I mean, and especially in America or the US, you have access to PE mysids, which um, are quite good, I believe, um, down here. And unfortunately, they irradiate everything we import. So it takes a lot of the nutritional value away. So- Yeah, Marina's talked collect, about that. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, well, we generally collect um, our own mysids, which is a big part of our week. Um, we generally dive at the moment about three times a week, um, every sort of second day. So we dive yesterday, we'll dive tomorrow and hopefully get enough mysids through till Monday. Um, some days you go out, there can be literally millions. Some days you go out, for last Friday, we spent seven hours mm. uh, and six dives to get enough food to feed for a couple of days. Um, so- How many um, people do you, do sorry, go ahead. Uh, well, there's only myself and one other. Wow. So um, it's quite a full on, yeah. We so do. your day is like nonstop, check, check, you're doing all this. <laughs> um, yeah, look, we have um, like, I mean, I, my job roster actually sort of gives me um, the time to do this. Um, and it's not all doom and gloom because we do sleep at the fire station. Um, so um you know some nights we do get six or seven hours sleep um just last night unfortunately it wasn't one of those nights um someone left the popcorn machine on at the local picture theater and it went up at 1 30 in the morning oh, no. um so oh, i was all right i was only no, no just a little bit of damage in the kitchen um and no one was hurt that's the main thing um so um yeah it's it seems to work it's some days are better than others and it helps having, I've been very lucky that I've got good employees um, and um, they go the extra mile when, when asked and um, are happy to learn the, the, the bits and pieces. And yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's all good. Absolutely. And yeah, um, I think he told us before we started, or it might have been during the silent period, but he also is a firefighter. So he's, he's got, he's never stopping. This guy's amazing. Um, okay. So, and you, you talked a little bit about collecting um, the foods and you said that sea dragons, both species are not, the, you know, they aren't, it's not impossible to train them under frozen. Um, look, I mean, the, probably the biggest hurdle for particularly the leafies is there, there isn't a lot of them about and they are a very expensive animal. Um, and they are probably at this stage best left. I do know there are some in private hands in Japan. Um, the Japanese have a premise for, they like to spend a lot of money on fish, um, but we actually flew to Japan and helped set up the system. And um, we've done a lot of work in Japan. We've actually been, um, it's been we've done work a little bit with NHK and Shizuka TV over there making various TV specials about the local um, fish life here and um, but the weedies in particular I think yeah I mean as we talked before about Deborah's tank um, I actually took got her to send me some photos of her tank the other day because I'm trying to convince my partner that we need a tank at home um, and I think Deborah's is a very very good example of um, what can be achieved um, it's it's minimalist but it's it looks good and the animals are healthy um, the same with uh, Colby, um, 
Yeah. You know, Colby did a fantastic job with the animals. Um, and I think Alicia's had them now for a couple of years. And so those animals are probably coming up four years old now. So doing great. Um, yeah. It, it's very doable. Um, Absolutely. It's just, you just got to, it's like any animal. You just got to make sure you can meet the animal's needs and um, be prepared to, um, I mean, it's not like a dog where you can put it in the kennels if you go on holiday, um, that you have the it's a commitment. capacity to, yeah. to, for them to be looked after whilst you're away. Absolutely. And um, Deborah actually speaks very highly of you. And she is um, going to, she, it, because of the time differences, which mess us all up, she's going to get with me on the side and do, instead of a live stream, a video. So hopefully we'll be sharing yeah. some of those pictures uh, soon too. Yeah. Um, and she did. No, and yeah, good. go ahead. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah. Oh, okay. No, no, she, no, like I say, yeah, she's very good. And she's, she's, she's asked a lot of questions over the years, but I mean, we're here to help. I mean, I've never turned anyone away. Um, it might take me a day or two to get back to you sometimes, but we're, we're always welcome to help. Um, we're pretty easy to find. Um, my um, stepdaughter is putting me together a website that we're going to hopefully have up and running shortly. Um, and um, so maybe through that, we might have a portal um, that people can contact or either by Facebook either. I mean, yeah, we're pretty, we're pretty, I said, I'm pretty easy going um, and we'll try and answer the questions best as possible. Um, some people get a little bit upset when you inquire about their setup because um, we're just trying to make sure that people have got the requirements they need if they do want them. Um, but that's on you, not me. Um, I'm sure. <laughs> happy to provide the information and um, yeah, it's... I remember the first time I reached out to you, um, I believe it was either about seahorses or sea dragons, I'm not sure, but I was so nervous because, you know, you're quite a big name over here. And, and I, I'll tell you guys, he, he's so nice and just, you know, responds to nobody's, you know, he'll still try to help you. It's really great. Um, so yeah. I, I do want to get through these questions so that you can make sure that we, we can yeah. get a little tour. Um, but so the, the ones that you sell, um, when you breed them and sell them, are they, can, can, could someone say, I want, want, I want them trained onto frozen? Is that possible? Uh, look, we do. Yes, we do train. Like we have a certain number that, and we're actually introducing more today. Um, we keep our little posse of ones that are on frozen and we introduce other animals so that it's, um, oh, they see the other animals eating frozen. I mean, I don't know if it works or not, but it seems to work for us. Yeah. And we keep them separated in a separate tank. Um, and, um, yeah, look, we can do it. We do charge more for it because there is more work involved. Um, we have to stand there and watch the meat and make sure they're eating. Excuse me. Um, and, um, but yeah, look, I mean, I think anyone who's going through this medium and, and is into, you know, chatting about it would have a fairly good understanding of the animals uh, in sense of what they require, which, you know, is a fairly large tank, um, good filtration, obviously chillers if you live in... Um, I mean, we get uh, very hot winters here. Uh, sorry, the other way around. Very hot summers in general, and very cold winters. Um, so we have we run um, quite big heat chill pumps that either heat or cool the water. Um, and otherwise, it's just it's just basic husbandry, monitoring the animals. Um, as as you do with any normal marine aquarium fishy. I mean, if you've had an animal for a while, you you, you sort of know when it's not right. Um, I mean, even here in our factory, we know that something's not right by the sounds that we hear all the time and one of, one of the pumps is going or something like that. So it's just getting that in tune, I suppose, um, with what you're doing and watching the animals and just um, and when you feed them, obviously, that they are eating. And um, so, yeah, I don't think they're any, any harder than any other animal. Um, but they're kind they, of like seahorses where you have to know the requirements yeah okay. and and it, you, they require commitment and um at the start it can be quite a commitment financially um and ongoing i suppose i mean i don't know what mice would sell for over there but if uh, over here though you're sort of running ten dollars a packet say so you're going to have a couple of packets of mice a week um if you have two dragons so i mean it's not outrageous um we do if people want animals locally here, we do actually show them where to go and get their mycids. And we have taken a couple of people out on the boat and um, showing them initially how to get mycids. Um, we've rescued a couple because they they've lied a little bit about their diving ability. Um, oh. So yeah. we've had two 
rescue them and bring them home. But um, yeah, so I don't think yeah they're any any more harder than any other animal. Um, and in some ways, raising them is probably easier because they don't have a uh, a platonic stage. They mm. we, our our baby dragons go straight onto baby mice. It's, oh, nice. um, and we mix we mix it in with baby brine. Um, but about two years ago, we stopped feeding baby brine initially, and we actually get really good growth rates. Um, we're just lucky by virtue of location that we can get that stuff quite easily. So yeah. that's probably the key to our success actually is location. <laughs> yeah. That, I mean, I, I, that's, I would love to keep sea dragons, but I just know I'm not in a good location. I could not get sourced the things that I would need. I think it's so amazing though. And mm-hmm. I can't wait to talk to Deborah. Hey, I want to say really quick farm boy. Thank you so much. I just didn't want to interrupt, but really appreciate the support for the channel. Okay. Um, so with, uh, sorry, sorry, I got, I got myself distracted. See what you did. Mm. <laughs> Um, okay, that's what I wanted to ask is how often, like with seahorses, we kind of really hone in on the fact that they, they do, but you can feed them just twice a day, but they do much better if you feed them multiple times. Is there any, tri- what do you tell someone buying um, sea dragons? Well, how often do when they we feed? feed live, we saturate feed. So we put the food directly into their tanks and they can help themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, when we feed frozen, uh, we feed three times a day. So we feed it in the morning around lunchtime and then in the evening around six o'clock, um, I come in every night when I can, uh, around six or seven, um, depending on the weather. Whether it's winter, I come in earlier because obviously we know the lighting thing with the dragons, um, and we can't just walk in and bang the lights on. So, and we give them a final feed um, about an hour before it gets dark. Uh, we have skylights in our roof, which gives us natural light. Um, and yeah, I mean they, the ones on frozen are doing really well. Um, so yeah, very similar. We we've, we've well, so we saturate feed and our seahorses the same. They get fed two or three times a day. Uh, on weekends, um, we bring it, we scale it back to once a day on a Sunday, um, just so we can have a little bit of time to do stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, yeah, that's about it. Nice. And um, okay, let me, let me look through my notes here, make sure I got everything. Um, so oh, actually, what's the light thing? You said we all know the light thing. I don't know the light thing. What's the uh, light oh, thing? Oh, sorry. So, <laughs> no. yeah, so dragons don't cope well with sudden changes of dark to light. Um, so like when we pack, if we pack at night, we, uh, when where the dragons are, we, we get the animals out. We have red lights that we put up. Um, and then we, either that or if it's going to be an earlier, but it's still dark, we actually leave the lights on. Um, yeah, they don't cope well, especially from dark to light. And um, on it, and our big tanks, when we have done it, they, they all come to the surface and poke their snouts out and run around a bit silly. Um, it doesn't kill them or anything, but it's just not a... It stresses them. If you can avoid doing it, like we have um, also dimmers on our lights. So mm. um, in the evening, if we are working back, we over a, a half hour period, we will slowly dim our lights down before we close down for the night. Gotcha. Very cool. Okay. I didn't know that. Did you guys know that? I didn't know that. Um, are there any other unique things to, to sea dragons? I know you do more than just sea dragons and we want to get on that and have you return, um, but go ahead. Um, no, not really. I mean, the light thing is a big thing. I'm um, obviously it's like things like sound and we, we try and avoid, um, like, um, our neighbor here used to do a bit of spray painting and we used to get fumes coming over. Mm. So we, we sort of asked him if you'd mind, spray painting a little bit further to the north which he was he did um and just things like that and um we try and um and obviously like cleanliness i mean we uh we've got our own little tanker that we go and get ourselves uh we get about ten thousand liters of seawater a week um and we store it on site here we've got a twenty thousand liter tank to store our own water uh we just use natural seawater we change probably maybe five to 10% a month. Um, obviously our systems are quite large. Um, right. We've got a little over a hundred thousand liters of systems now. So, um, and- Are they all connected? Yeah. Are, are the systems uh, all- No, no, oh. no, we've got separate systems. Most of our dragon systems are around 12,000 liters. Um, they consist of uh, two 5,000 liter aquaculture tanks and a 2,000 plus the sump and a few other bits and pieces. Um, but no, we've got about seven systems now, I think. Um, and our, our new little seahorse system that we've set up, um, 
we are just trying, uh, at the moment, we're just running them separate tanks with sponge builders just to keep it basic until we can sort of get a little bit more time and we'll connect them in. Um, and because they're tropical um, and most of our stuff's temperate. Um, but uh, no, we run, yeah, I think, so like some of our tanks for keeping the deep water crabs are run at eight degrees. So um, we have to sort of separate them out. And most of our dragon systems run around 16, 17. Um, uh, that was a most of the year round. We don't we don't tend to put the temperature up or down too much. We just let them run at that temperature, and they run plus or minus one degree normally. See, and I wish Ray was here to to convert that to Fahrenheit for me, <laughs> but I'll do it later. Um, but no, uh, so yeah, I mean you're sharing so uh, much. Well, sixteen or seventeen is about um, probably fifty fifty four. Oh wow, so cool. Yeah, sixteen. So kind of more like in a like keeping abdominalis. You got to keep them at the lower temperature and steady temperature. Well, I'm actually sitting in front of my computer here. So actually, sorry. So 16 degrees Celsius is 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. So yeah. So like abs kind of got to keep so them. 60, so between CSA 60 and 65, I would say at your end. Gotcha. Um, and so the bottom line is that if somebody, if an individual is willing to fork over the money and set up properly and it, all they need to do is contact you and you'd be happy to help them figure out what they need and whether uh, it's doable. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, what we'd like to see if that did happen is a good, um, you know, a good month or two of question asking, um, hopefully them not minding us, you know, asking what sort of system they've got. A lot of people do get a bit, like say before, they do get a bit cranky when you ask them about experience and, oh, you know, I've kept seahorses for years and I know how to raise baby brine when you ask them about the access to myocids. Um, and we have, there's some people that we've not sold to because it just didn't sit right with us. Um, I think and, that's great. Um, I mean, that's just the way it is. Um, you know, if you were a dog breeder and you didn't think someone was going to look after your dog, you wouldn't sell them the dog. Um, you know, we sort of feel the same way because um, we do put a lot of effort into raising these animals and um, it's yeah it's a seven day a week 365 day gig so um, we want to give the animals the best chance at the other end uh, and also give the people the best chance too because if they spend especially from the US I mean the freight costs to the US at the moment are quite horrendous. Um, That's what I was going to ask is, is shipping killing you? <laughs> Um, it is to a degree. I mean, um, we've we've done we've done some stuff to scripts, um, Ripley's. I mean, uh, we've supplied a lot of stuff to the US in the past. Um, uh, yeah, better part um, like Dallas, Florida, the uh, California, um, Kentucky. Um, yeah. So uh, and like. Um, a uh, very good friend is Paula Carlson at Dallas, um, and we've been to Dallas a couple of times, and she's hosted us, and and we've met her at various places around the world. We've been travelling, um, so it's all and it's good too. Like Colby, you know, we met up a few times, and it's always good to have um, and it's we, you know good friends that we we talk to each, each other on Facebook, and not only about seahorse stuff but other stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, Colby's just had a baby, um, so yeah, it's all good stuff. Paula is amazing. I just want to say that for sure. She's she helps me with women and reefing and she's just, she's just great. I agree with you. She's wonderful. Yeah. Um, and so, and I'm going to ask Deborah on the side, that'll be a question for Deborah is how, like I said, I'm guessing they can do like group deals and stuff or not, not, not in, on your end, but you supply wholesalers too, right? So yeah, there are we mainly to... like, so De Deborah bought her animals from the young, the young marine life in um, the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously they buy, um, and the video that we actually, when you used as the promo, is uh, the leafies that we sent them probably close to two years ago now. Um, so, um, yeah, we do work with wholesalers because they order bigger numbers. And, you know, like I said, I mean, um, if I was in this for the money, I would have given up given up years ago. But, um, but we still have to cover our costs and make enough money to pay the, pay the bills. Absolutely. Um, so, um, yeah, if people want to order 20 animals, so that's more advantageous for us. Absolutely. So, uh, guys, um, I'm going to, I've already been asking him so many questions. I'm going to get to your questions in the comments, and then he's going to give us a little tour. Um, one more Sea Dragon question from Dylan's Little Hobby said, 
Um, do they use camouflage like seahorses do, the sea dragons? Um, look, they, where you catch the animals, um, yes, certainly. They, um, where we dive, and again, I'll go back to Pang, uh, Pang Fong. If you look for his videos, he's got a YouTube channel. Um, he does a lot of videoing of the animals in the wild. So you'll get a, an idea of where uh, they hang out and how they blend in. And certainly, um, we did notice, and I actually put some photos up, we had animals in different tanks, and then we put them outside to take some photos, and we realized that they actually had totally different colorations. So, um, and so one tank was more exposed to sunlight than the other tank, and it had different colored, because we only use plastic plants, because we, we take them out, and we bleach them every second week. Um, so, yeah, I mean, they do certainly do color up to their environment, yeah, to a degree, yes. Awesome. Um, and it does seem like lighting just plays a huge role with them. Um, and yeah. so that's a good, another good question that I didn't ask you is you, you mainly see people keeping sea dragons in pretty like bare or artificial, not, not a big rocky thing, right? Um, look, yeah, no, they need swimming space. Um, cause they do get quite large. I mean, the larger sea dragons pop out at sort of 30 centimeters or, um, a little over 12 inches. Um, and even bigger um so and they they swim vertically so they, they like their vertical space um okay. you know, the minimum size i think would be you know sort of a, a six by three by three for a pair of dragons um if uh, deborah's tank is four foot high by four foot wide i think um i mean that's a that's just a super duper tank um but she's done the right thing she's only got four animals in there she hasn't loaded it down and she's kept it as a specific species tank, which I think is a good idea as well, because um, it keeps everything to a minimum, the introduction of um, any parasites and things like that. And they aren't the, um, yeah, they sort of can't stand up for themselves too well, the old sea dragon, they, they, they get bullied around quite easily. So they're good in a species only tank. Or sit, I mean, a mixture of uh, leafies and weedies is okay. Uh, certainly a lot of public aquariums do that and it's no problem but um, yeah species tank is certainly more more um, preferred wise yeah no I that we say the same thing for seahorses and um, so I the vertical swimming caught me and so they they need a lot of space to swim because they're not like seahorses obviously they don't hitch but I'm saying that they, they like no, to no, swim so around very, and all no, that so well well this uh, I'm not sure you know so this basically three species of sea dragons that they know of now so you've got the the two that we know about the the leafy and the weedy which they don't have prehensile tails um the ruby sea dragon which was filmed uh in southern western australia 2016 i think it was um which looks it looks a little more like a weedy than a leafy um but it's the bright red it's called a ruby sea dragon i remember um, that now go it, ahead sorry yeah. <laughs> It does have a prehensile tail, so um, it's sort of a cross between a seahorse and a. And there's another one that we're looking at breeding. It's the um, Dampier sea dragon, um, which they call um, well, and the name eludes me at the moment. Um, but we haven't got brood. We have uh, we supplied them to Paul of, back in 2007. They bred them quite successfully. Um, what's the name of those things? Um, Anyway, I'll, I'll think about it. Um, when you think but, of it, uh, shout it out. I do it all the time. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, I've just, uh, mine's a bit of a blank. Um, anyway. You've been up all night. Computer. It's all right. <laughs> yeah, no, nah, that's right. Um, He's looking it up. Yeah, See? I've got my, uh, I've got my computer in front of me, so. Uh, Go right ahead. The seahorse corner said, Deb said they're fast swimmers way faster than seahorses. That amazed me. Yeah, I think they're, I mean, although they're saying sign nathids, I can never say that correctly. And he's covered, you know, that species only is still ideal and they do have specific requirements. It's not difficult. It's just different. So they're like, you know, it's the same kind of deal, but I think they're pretty different. It's seeming like, you know, would you keep seahorses with sea dragons? Uh, I would prefer not to. Uh, ribbon sea dragon, that's what I was trying to think of. Um, oh, I remember uh, Paula talking Cynthia, about those. Yeah, Halia Cynthia's Canio, oh, my Latin, Canio <laughs> Iphorus. Um, so um, that's a species that we're hoping to breed, but they're only found in northwestern Australia. Um, and um, 
we actually had <laughs> we got interneted frauded out of we had seven coming a little while ago and um we got internet frauded out of the money we transferred to pay for them so um a bit of a bummer um yeah so um yeah look at a pinch we could keep them together but um you know i just think if you can keep them apart it would be better and even for the seahorses i mean the dragons are quicker than the seahorse so if you're feeding frozen you probably find that um your dragons would sort of perhaps maybe overwhelm your seahorses and feeding um gotcha it's, it's not something we do we we keep them in the same system um but we don't have them in the same tanks yeah dan's talked um on the show before about like the galt stuff it's it's sciencey and way beyond me but and i know that like these guys they just you don't want to stress them and and anything that's going to stress them or put them in a situation where they're competing is probably not the best thing for them sounds like um no no and it's just um and again i mean if um you sort of if you're going to spend the money on to set it up you know you might you might as well try to do it properly uh, and um the a seahorse system can be a fairly basic system um it doesn't it doesn't have to it's not it doesn't have to be too fancy whereas you know Certainly, the, and the, probably the essential item with dragons too is a, is a big UV unit. Um, mm. We run 540 watt UVs on our systems. Um, they run 854 watt tubes in each system. So, and that's probably an essential item, or if not one of the essential items that you need, um, because they do have a precursor to uh, urinema. Um, mm. And once you get urinema in the dragons, as the seahorses, they're it's beyond help really not a great deal you can do um has that and, occurred with um, you have you had that happen or um, many many years ago yes uh when i first started out um i was a little bit naive um and um tried to just raise the dragons in with the other fish i was collecting and stuff like that and yeah we weren't too successful and then um slowly um found out more information and then there's actually a really um rob jones and it's, it's available to anyone um there's a book put out that's been done in association with dr rob jones and um sea life melbourne and aquarium um and it's about a 38 page book about dragons and their care and their requirements um and we normally would send that to someone who if they we've got permission to use it so there's no problems there we've got permission from rob and um sea life to use it um and um it's actually quite a good book it's been written over and revised over many many years by the actress and the vets and others um to provide the most some pretty good information and certainly a good starting um good starting block for those who might be considering it to give you an idea of what's required is it online uh yeah okay. um i um if yeah i'll I think find out yeah if it's someone who's good at google i mean um or that i've got your email here yeah I, i'll i'll attempt to find it and then i can send a link to you to it as will um, i and guys you can check the comments later i will if we as long as we can find it i'll get that link in the description after we're done um and uh i'm sorry i, I want to move forward but people keep asking questions <laughs> reef doink <laughs> said what kind of cost do the sea dragons uh, have like um four pairs shipped or, I mean, you mainly, you don't ship just a pair, right? You typically would ship. Um, look, I mean, it's up to the individual. It's, it's more expensive because obviously the, the customer pays the shipping. So, um, but generally we don't ship less than five, um, which gives us a hundred kilos, which gives you, um, cause we only ship one per box, um, especially, well, especially when they're older. Um, so we ship them in 20 liters of water um, and we ship them with no, no air void in the bag, but we super saturate the bags up to about 240, 250% of O2 with pure O2. And, and that method gets us 60 hours. Um, we did a shipment to the new aquarium at St. Louis uh, in December, and they missed their connecting flight in LA and they were in the boxes for 58 hours and oh. all survived. Um, so, um, so in that sense, they're, they're not too bad to ship um just the price at the moment uh the freight rate from here to la we only ship to la um mm -hmm. you know and so we 
like we use global animal transport and mainly um, to on ship. Um, he looks after the clearances in LA and then he looks after the domestic side of it because domestic travel within the US to get to wherever is yeah it's sort of a little bit beyond us um, to be able to understand how like to, to get to expedite to get animals there as quickly as possible. Sure. Um, so we generally ship to LA and then from LA and the expenses involved in that uh, are on the customer. Um, sure. So at the moment it runs about $10 US a kilo, which is about 2.2 pounds. Um, so, you know, for a 20 kilo box, you're looking at close to $200. Um, that's actually not as bad as I thought, but go ahead. <laughs> Anyways. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's about a 300% increase on in what we used to pay pre, uh, pre COVID. Oh. Um, so, uh, hopefully it'll go back. Like, well, hopefully, I, I mean, it's more, I mean, it's the vaccine rollout, um, which obviously the, I mean, the U S is, uh, rolling out massive amounts of vaccine where we're starting to see and i mean we got locked down very hard here in victoria for a long time mm -hmm. um so hopefully yeah with vaccine rollouts and uh a bit of a, a reversal in numbers that international travel will open up um freight's always been there um but at the moment yeah for us to get to the us even it's it's not impossible but we we have to make sure we book because things change on a daily basis Absolutely. Um, and uh, sorry, I was letting Cheryl in, so I got dis di um, mm. distracted. But for sure, you know, obviously, it, even even Holly and I are talking about she's shipping me some seahorses and the prices change constantly. And it totally depends on what's mm. going on and the time and everything else. But yeah. um, I just can't thank you so much for sharing because so many people are interested in this. And one more thing I was curious about before we talk, just a couple more questions about um, other things that you're working on and then you can give us a tour if you can still um but yeah yeah so yeah, we've talked with chris um which who you and i have talked um today mm -hmm. about a little bit and other people but so, so you can ship things to us but we can't ship things to you right like we can buy um, a u.s could get your breviceps or your sea dragons but you couldn't get our erectus is that correct no, because Australia doesn't allow the import of any aquacultured animals. Um, so uh, any broodstock seahorses, say that Seahorse Australia has, was imported prior to, um, we can't import signatives here from the wild at all. Um, it's a total ban. So anything that was in the country at that time is okay. But yeah, we, and aquacultured animals 100% ban on here. Um, wow. we, same with coral. We can't import coral from any other country. Um, so we have very strict border controls here. Yeah. Even state to state. Um, I can't ship inverts to Western Australia. They, they won't allow inverts. So yeah. And Tasmania, when I ship animals to Rochelle, um, they allow them in, but they go through a uh, quarantine control area and get inspected. So is it, sure is it mainly, you, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Is it mainly about them not wanting anything released into the wild and corrupting um, the... Um, probably to a certain degree. Um, certainly for us, I mean, I've mentioned before about perhaps trying to reintroduce some sea dragons right. and we'll have a few hurdles to cross there. But in general, all of our permits state that we cannot return any animals to the wild. Um, I mean, unfortunately, probably Florida is a bit of a classic case within the US of what can go wrong if, if animals are released into the wild. And we do have problems here with um, some animals uh, like marine sea stars, particularly here in Melbourne, that came in and ballast water ships. Um, and um, we have a particular type of uh, frog here that is, well, uh, it's a cane toad. There was, in, there was 30 of them introduced about 100 years ago, and now there's millions of them, and they've taken over the whole of Northern Australia. Um, so yeah, they're very, very um, mindful here of biosecurity. Yeah. Probably not quite as bad as New Zealand, um, but still up there. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't say, I'm not definitely not saying it's wrong. I understand they're trying to protect it. Just, I, I'm just yeah. glad we can still get from you. I just feel bad you can't get from yeah. us. Maybe it's a well, good I mean, thing there though. are people talking about, especially now, I mean, even um, I work in, I have licenses to correct mean aquarium animals in the, uh, in the Queensland and the rules are tightening up all the time. And with the, uh, Australia as a market, we're a big country, but we're not a big population. So, you know, when the yellow tang thing came in out of Hawaii with the banning 
of collection. Everyone's going, oh, well, you know, we'll just buy yellow tanks from um, Biota. Well, you can't because they're aquacultured. So people are saying to me, well, why don't you breed them? Well, because the market's not big enough here to warrant the cost. Um, and so the ideal thing would be yeah, to be import them from Biota. And that's a win-win for everyone because um, you're not taking animals from the wild. You're supporting um an industry that is employing people in another country and um, te theoretically you're getting animals that are more suitable to a captive environment. So, um, but yeah, so we're still, in Australia, we still have a little way to go perhaps to catch up with the rest of the world on um, getting ourselves into the 21st century with some of our biosecurity uh, rules. Sure, that makes sense. And um, actually, I wanted to ask too, what other um, I kind of asked you in, asked you in the beginning, but aside from sea dragons, you do other things. So, what are the other main species that you are breeding? Um, well, or, breeding or wise, yeah. Uh, well, breeding wise, river sets and um, they call it a flat-tailed pipefish, which we'll show you shortly. Um, so they're just there's two locals, so, um, and we've got a truckload of pop belly seahorses, which the original animals were from um, Rochelle. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, we've actually had to stop them breeding because we were getting too many. Um, so, um, and then um, we collect, um, so at the moment we are collecting for um, displays for a couple of public aquariums in the US. Um, we're collecting for some aquariums in um, the Middle East, uh, in Bahrain, uh, Abu Dhabi and Dubai. Um, so, it's, it's not huge displays. It's a lot of it's based around. Um, we also, we do, for the last 12 years, we've worked with one of the local universities. Every year we go out and collect um, a species of animal for them that they use uh, for the School of Regenerative Medicine. Um, and they're trying to regenerate human organs um, for medical purposes. Uh, one of the big universities, Monash University here in Melbourne. Um, so, I mean, that's good, a, a good little thing that we like to do. Um, so And so, that's why we have our big tank set up. And from that, it's led to us collecting larger animals. Um, and if people go onto our Facebook page and sort of scroll back through to 2000, you'll see that, you know, thousand kilo containers um, that we ship to Japan with elephant sharks and stuff like that. So that's I, so I, I interesting. Like I'm sorry, yeah. go ahead. Sorry, Karen. No, no, you're right. I, I was just going to say, I find that so interesting. I mean, that your main um, uh, buyers are not low. I mean, you, you're, you're supplying the world. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Um, yeah, and... look, I mean, we, we do do we do do uh, work with Quality Marine, okay. um, and we supply a, quite a bit of stuff to Quality and um, other like the Young Marine Life. So we've got maybe three or four wholesalers that we supply animals for for the aquarium trade, like the ornate cowfish, which we'll show you, um, and some other species that are quite iconic. And we used to work a little bit with. Um, Josh Groves and um, Stu Wobby from Coldwater Aquatics up in Portland, mm -hmm. um, but they've sort of moved on to do other stuff now. So, um, you, know, um, you know, the temperate stuff would be good, but I think, you know, it's, it's um, uh, there's a guy that used to have a, he's, he's from Oregon. He used to, he had a website called Oregon Reef and he used to have a temperate aquarium. He doesn't collect anymore. And he used to get stuff out of Fujian Sound and we sent him stuff and it's, um, we are in the midst of wanting to set up a, a temperate tank just to show people that it can be quite they can look really really nice um mm -hmm. you know but everyone's stuck on coral these days um so well when you set up that temperate tank make sure to video all of it and we'll share the heck out of it and i know chris chris yeah. is working on some cool displays and different ideas at seahorse yeah, world so yeah. you guys you know, Chris is, could not be here tonight because he's uh, got stuff. So, anyways, uh, yeah, no, that's be... right. yeah, so Chris, Chris will actually be here in a couple of weeks. So yes. we're giving him. Um, he's going to transport some animals down. That we're we're donating some animals to Seahorse World. Um, so we're donating um, the river sets and and we swap animals. Um, so I that's great. I know I know Rochelle Hawkins very well and been uh, good friends with her for. Ooh, I would say probably 15 years now. Um, so yeah, so no, we've always got on well and we try and reciprocate where we can within the, the trade, so to speak. 
So the so last question, and then I'm going to let you do your um, walk through, and then we'll take any other questions. I know because I know I've kept you too long already. I'm sorry, but you're just so fascinating. I'm fascinated by this conversation. But so the, the 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 main projects on your horizon are to get the website up, maybe get the the leafies, um, 100% captive, or you know, breeding 100%. Yeah. Those are any other goals that you have that you hope to. Um, no, nah, look, I'm probably about it. I've, it's one thing I've learned over the years is, you know, be pragmatic about what you do. Set yourself achievable goals. I mean, um, we, like I said, the sort of the holy grail for me before I get out of this gig is um, to hopefully, if there's a, you know, in 20 years' time, there's a paper written about the breeding of leafy sea dragons that my name's on there somewhere. Yes. Um, so, um, but otherwise, no, we're just podding along. We... Um, I mean, the last 12 months, 18 months has been challenging. So we've managed to keep all of our employees. Um, we've managed to survive. And that's been, probably been the, the big focus over the last 12 months. So hopefully moving forward now and coming out of COVID, we can move more towards those goals um, and um, increasing our sales and, and doing a bit more with um, um, temperate collection. Um, we are trying, that's the reason for the website is we're trying to, particularly with public aquariums, um, be nice, you know, just um, not main displays, but certainly no, you know, like there is quite a few. I mean, I know it, um, I think it's Newport Aquarium. They've got a really nice Southern Australian display. Um, we're doing some stuff for Shed Aquarium as well um, and Monterey Bay. So um, yeah, it's all, um, it's all quite good, and we're just you know, there's only was only was well, me, and my partner, and Justine who works for me. Um, so we're, we're a little small entity, and um, but between us we seem to make it work. So and everyone's very supportive, which helps. And yeah, we will just hopefully... you know what for you guys to be one of the only people even allowed to collect these animals for you to have succeeded with the breeding, even a little bit, you're making advancements that are helping all of it i mean you're you're doing great things and i'm just i'm not only thrilled that you came to chat with us but just thrilled that the work that you're doing i thank you so much because okay, you're making thank you. yeah well no it means a lot i mean we do well, well none of us are scientists um i leave school very young and i spent 12 years in the military so i certainly haven't got a, a marine science background um <laughs> justine has my wife's a social worker so yeah we're sort of but we've evolved as we have to, to to sort of try and um, mainly because we have a passion for it more than anything, I think. Um, and without that, you you certainly wouldn't want to finish work at eight o'clock in the morning and then come and clean tanks for another two hours or go diving in eight degree water in winter, um, eight degrees Celsius. Now that's cold, um, which is what we have to do to get our food in winter. So yeah, it's um, but a combination of those facts and having a good support network and um, and just good, nice feedback from people. Um, it sort of makes it all worthwhile, so that's good. Hey, and I'll make sure that the um, link to the Facebook page, and then when you get the website up, let me know. I'll make sure those links are shared around so everybody can check it out. But um, I'm gonna okay. I'm gonna hush my mouth now and let you give us a little walkthrough and let, let me make you bigger. And then anybody else who has questions, um, you know, get them in yeah. the comment section now. Um, can you so run? does it go through my camera or does it go through the front of the phone? Okay, so it, can you, does it have any button to flip? Does it? Uh, it does, but not that I can see. I don't want to lose you. Okay. Maybe we'll just um, work on a slight angle. And uh, so if you make it full screen and then we'll try and do a slight angle shot, like sort of like that, okay. that you can still hear what? me and I can still see what's going on. Okay, so sorry guys, <laughs> trying to fix it. Hang on, I'm trying to make you big screen and I just totally messed it up. One second. We'll get it right. I told you we're laid back here, but we can, I, again, I just keep thanking you because I think it's so great that you came and shared all this. People really are interested in sea dragons. Yes, I'm yeah. stalling because the screen's all messed up. It just takes me one minute. Sorry, guys. Well, you're working on that, Kelly? Yes, go ahead. Uh, I have a question. Uh, one of the things that everybody's been intrigued about is hippocampus zebra. Ah. Yeah. Um, look, there was... Um, they're so rare. Um, there was nine caught uh, by one of the West Australian collectors a couple of months ago. I know they ended up here in Melbourne, but um, who got them and what they're doing with them, I have no idea. 
Um, we did inquire, um, but the the cost was just very prohibitive. Yeah, um, that's what Chris so, said. So, yeah, I mean, it's something that we would love to get and try and breed. And I thought I had an inkling of who had them, and I approached them about maybe a cooper co co cooperative um, venture. Um, if they did have them, they weren't letting on. If they didn't, they just they declined anyway. So, um so we're, we're trying with the ribbon sea dragons. Um, we're also going to try with uh, the Lazanatas clowns um, and uh, some of the other species of seahorses and like the West Australian seahorse, the Angustus, uh, the Elongatus. Um, oh yeah. And so those are, and they're more readily available to get brewing yeah. stock. So hopefully over the next 12 months, unfortunately, they're a little bit hard at the moment because most West Australian collectors are concentrating on coral, um, the coral, sales have gone through the roof since COVID. And I mean, they're in a business um, to make to to make money. So you've got to make hay while the sun shines, I suppose. So, but maybe, you know, in the, within the next 12 months, it's something that we can investigate. That would be nice. Well, when I first started working with Sanantheids, uh, nobody was even able to raise seed or any of the dragons. So that in yeah. itself is an accomplishment, yes. obvious. Yeah, look, I mean, it's just like we've like there's little things that we've learned along the way, and um, and each year you still learn. And I mean, even down from collecting the animals, collecting them at the right time, um, we've got a a 3.5 meter tank laying down on its side out the back of our uh, facility that we I had built, um, which has been built specifically for the leafies to give them the vertical space they need to breed. Um, I should have measured measured twice and cut once though because uh the, it, it's actually a little bit tall to get in the door so we're gonna have to take it a little bit off the top oh, but um it's the reason it's still laying on its side out the back but so that's um and yeah i think the <coughs> fresh that we get um i think helps very much and um seems to well, obviously it's a natural food to the animals and it's obviously very nutritious being live and uh we, we get it fresh quite often uh, okay. Just to let you know, Steve, I have you full screen now as good as possible. He, he chose to use phone okay. so that he could okay. give us the walkthrough. Um, so bear guy. with us. All right. Let's see. Uh, it's we'll kind of hard. See, I think you should try to flip it. I don't think you should lose us. If, uh, you, if you touch on the phone okay. on the screen, something should come up in a corner or something. Okay, stop the, um, don't stop it. Uh, chat meeting raise hand. Anybody on a phone know how to flip the screen? Anybody watching? Mm -hmm. Hang on, go ahead. Nice, uh, I know there's when you're using the camera, there's a little thing that looks like an arrow in a circle, and you touch it, and it yeah, you can't find it on the screen. It's trying to oh. find it, guys. Sorry. <laughs> He, he actually didn't even have Zoom, so we had to make him do all this work to get here. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. okay, your camera's off now. Are you still there? Okay, if we lose him, I'll try to get him back. Hang on. Sorry, guys. This tour is going to be really cool, so give me just a second. At least you weren't an hour late to the meeting. Oh, you know, uh, Cheryl, the first 10 minutes, we didn't have sound on. You know, it's Wine Wednesday. If you... I, I, I'm, I'm still on daylight savings time. So ah. I'll, off a bit. I don't, I don't even set clocks back. <laughs> okay, well, I don't know if we lost him. I'd hate to just leave a big uh, name. Hey, Steve, if you can still hear me, um, you got to turn your camera and audio back on. He's probably trying to figure it out, guys. Um, Cheryl, uh, nope. Maybe yeah, there you go. I've got you back again. Okay, he's, um, he's back. And I wish I knew sorry. how to flip it. Oh my gosh, I wish I could tell you. Um, Let me see if I can look. Justine? Um, <laughs> get Justine in here. Um, yeah, she's uh, a lot younger than I am. She might have more um, that's technology. And I'm about to jump in on my phone to see if it, uh, I can figure it out. Sorry, guys. One second. Um, 
She's uh, hiding well. Okay, if this screeches on you guys, I apologize. I'm jumping in on my phone to see if I can figure it uh, out. Uh, We're getting a kind of tour, you know. Hey. Um, bye. Oh, wait, you got us. We're good. Yeah, that was her sea drag. So, this is our main. So this is a, there's about uh, 80 animals in here. Um, so that's our, so these animals are from last year. These are ones that we would normally have sold by now, but they're, um, we haven't due to COVID. So we've got a lot more. Do they um, hang out in groups? Yeah, oh yeah, they hang out in groups, yeah. Um, so this is our baby tank. This is our, it's quite a deep tank, so you can, can you see them? Let's see. Down the bottom? Oh, yeah. A little bit, kind of hard, but I see them. Oh, there's some. They're very small. Yeah. Uh, it's two groups. And if you look closely, you can probably see the food swimming in the water. Um, so this is our one of our pot belly tanks. Um, oh yeah, see these them. Are the, these are the brevisets that we bred. Uh, there's one there. Um, if you have a look closely on the, the chain and the the um, plastic plants, you can see them. Oh yeah. And. If you look closely, you can see the food in there. So it's a combination of brine and um, baby mice. And these you said, guys did... are, um, these Go guys are, were born on the 1st of January this year. Wow. And you said you mainly collect mice. Do you, do you um, culture them at all or no? No, okay. no. Smart. <laughs> and, um, and these are the little pipe fish that we've bred. Oh yeah. oh, yeah. Point the camera down a little bit, if you can. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, they're little, but I see them. <laughs> yeah, so there's my finger as a, you can just see one eating there. Yeah. Uh, sneaking. So and these are the adult uh, pipe fish down here. Uh, you can see them they're sitting vertically in the tanks. As soon as I find just then, I'll see if we can reverse this. Uh, we appreciate phone. you doing this period. Don't I mean, if it if we don't get yeah. it perfect, we can always uh, video it up later. No worries. But yeah. so, um, do you so this is our tank with our um, my animals that are on the frozen. So oh, wow. as you can see, they're quite happy to come up and Say hello. They come to you like a rectus. I love it. Yeah. So yeah. they associate people with food now. So you can see them all coming up because they think they're going to get fed. So, so there's about 30 in here. Um, there's some of the food that's been left over from the morning feed there. Um, so yeah, so they quite happily come up and um, eat. Yes. So, uh, so this is one of our big systems. Uh, let's sort of see. Uh, that's oh my these tanks are twenty thousand liters each. Um, I'll just turn off the aerator so you can see the animals. Um, this is some of the like sea stars and other animals we get. Uh, how often do you have to clean like these systems, Steve? Oh, sorry. Um, I'm going to have to make it quite quick because my phone is dying very quickly. Oh, no. <laughs> um, well, you know um, what? We're going we're gonna to send everybody to your page anyways to see these videos yeah. of your animals. So but go ahead. Jackson shark here. Elephant shark. Uh, banjo shark on the windwear. Um, Oh, do you know how to reverse this? Nope. Oh, and we're meeting Justine. <laughs> um, Hello, Justine. Thank you. This is Justine. <laughs> Hi. Um, this should just be a little button. Yeah, that's what I thought. What happens if we go across? Yeah. Oh. 
Yeah. Maybe just go to full screen, I suppose, might be. So yeah. We've only got nine percent left, so. We've made this so complicated. Yeah. I'm sorry, guys, but this is okay. so cool. Yeah. Uh, so go. this is outside. This is one of our collecting boats. Nice. So this is what we use to go and get sharks and stuff with. Um, so we're moving in next door. We have more holding. Um, just to give you an idea. So there's two, well, that four systems in here. Uh, they're about, uh, what are they? They're 14, 13, 12,000 litres each, sorry. Um, and this tank here is our broodstock tank. So all the animals in here are either wild caught or animals that we've bred and kept for breeding. Um, you can see them down here. They don't seem to come yeah. up as much. <laughs> No, because these tanks are a lot deeper and these guys, yeah. so there's a little group here near the surface. Beautiful. Um, these are just uh, more animals that we bred. There's about, this is a separate brood. Um, so these guys, there's about 40 in here. Um, 38 actually, yeah. So amazing. Um, that's one of our UV units that we use. Um, um, These are just some more like fish that we catch, puffer fish and stuff. Um, oh, puffers. Um, and I'm sure you are. Uh, these are Cuda seahorses from Rochelle. Um, that we're just uh, working with at the moment. And we've got a little bit more here. We're sort of, this is what we're expanding our seahorse breeding into this area here. Um, so the logo, which you've seen, so that's the company car <laughs> and uh, and uh, and then we've got the a little water tanker that we collect our own seawater with uh, probably not much interest but there we go so we use that truck carries 3,000 litres of seawater wow and we can't, can't get our own seawater um, and that's about it really it's sort of mainly just like it's just what you guys do, but on a bigger scale in regards to the cleaning, just more of it and um, that type of thing. And we have a smaller boat that we have, we've set up specifically for going getting mice, but it's all locked up at the moment. Um, and uh, yeah, that's about it really. That's uh, a lot. Is there any questions? <laughs> yeah, let me, let me see if there's any questions. I know your phone's getting ready to die. And I do want to say that if you guys in the audience have questions, um, Steve is very cool with answering them. Just comment or, you know, I'll make sure that his information is attached um, to the to the um, comments. Sorry, I'm trying to make it small again. Cheryl, um, Holly, any questions while I try to adjust this back again? Are you using natural seawater for this, yes. for your tanks? Yeah, 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 we collect all of our water locally. Um, off one of the jetties um, and it, it gets over, uh, it's a very big tidal range where we collect from. So it gets turned over very easily twice a day, um, huge volumes. So we've never had any problems. We actually even supply one of the local shops here as well, just as a favor. Um, and he's a coral breeder and he doesn't have any issues. So yeah, no, we don't, we don't, because the amount we use, it would be uneconomic. Well, I'm gonna say we use yeah. about 10,000 liters a week. So to mix it up would be, um, unbelievably expensive. But you do yeah. use those huge UVs that, you know. Yeah, yeah, it. yeah. So we do. Yeah, they're, they're, they're uh, 854 watt tubes, which comes out to 460 watts, I think. Um, mass is not my forte. So, yeah, 8 by 54. Gotcha. 
And how often do you have to clean all of the systems? Like, what does that look like? Um, me, me personally, I try and get away with doing as little as possible. Um, because that's why I pay Justine while I'm looking at it. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Justine. But, no, this, the, the systems get cleaned every day. Um, so um, Justine's very efficient. She's got a little uh, routine that she does and then I clean them on weekends and then she comes in on Mondays and picks and, and cleans them better than what I've done on the weekends. So, um, yeah, um, but yeah, the, the dragon tanks, the seahorses tanks all get cleaned once a day. The big systems get cleaned at least no certainly no more than every second day. And we know we want to know from Justine: Is it amazing working with the dragons and with Steve? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she, she's not up for a pay rise, so she can be honest. Hello. <laughs> um, yeah, it's been six months since I've been working here, and um, yeah, I love every moment of it. It's a unique opportunity, and. Um, yeah, I, I just love caring for these animals. It's quite special and yeah, great, great opportunity. So yeah, I just absolutely love it. Well, I didn't mean to put you on the spot, but um, any huge challenges you guys would say, or what is your favorite thing about it or anything like that? I'm just trying to, I know the phone's dying, so I'm trying to get out anything I can. <laughs> no, that's okay. I think the biggest challenge is um, sourcing food for the dragons when the stocks are quite low. Um, cause it, it kind of cycles and at times the mycids, you know, where we kind of collect can be low. So that's probably the most challenging part I'd say is when the food's low, you know, the, there's some weeks where we're diving every single day and that can be quite, um, you know, it's, it's physical work. So that can be quite tiring. Um, and then, yeah, I guess, you know, for me personally, like it's really rewarding just, you know, raising these babies and seeing them grow and having, having good successes, you know, that's a real positive aspect of it. And that's really enjoyable to see them, to see them grow. That's probably the best part for me and just working with them daily too. I just, you know, have a, a real passion for marine life and it's, yeah, it's just super enjoyable. I've got nothing negative to say, really, to be honest. Yeah, sure. <laughs> well, and they see... She's, she's I, doing well. Sorry. <laughs> I, I, I compared them to Erectus. I know they're nothing like Erectus, uh, Hippocampus Erectus. But I, what I meant by that is my Hippocampus Erectus are a species that literally, Dan makes the comparison, if you have a peanut butter sandwich and are walking by the tank, they're up there trying to eat it. And so the, the sea dragons seem to really, you know, get yeah. it, know you. And know that you're gonna yeah. feed them. Yeah, especially our frozen train dragons. They're they're like little puppies. You come up to the tank and they'll all swarm to the top. They're quite cute. Same with the pot bellies and our breviceps. They're quite similar too. Um, but yeah, they're they're quite cute and it's hard to you know um, say goodbye. Yeah, yeah it's <laughs> kind of you get attached to them in that way because they do recognise you when you walk past and everything. So. Yeah, I try not to get too attached. <laughs> Absolutely. I've told her to stop naming them because you don't <laughs> name animals that you're going to sell. Yeah. Do you, do you know I was, excuse me, I was getting ready to ask, do you name them? And then I was like, no, don't ask that. Okay. <laughs> Good to know that you do. Yeah, <laughs> no, I do have names for some of them, but I try not to. Yeah. I think, well, she doesn't tell me anymore. Yeah. I so think, you know, you're secret. trying to put little personalities on them and name them. So I try, I try not to do that, but sometimes I can't help it. Do they have personalities? I've had a question recently um, about seahorse males and how they kind of, they, they, they compete in the, over females and they'll snick each other and fight. Do the sea dragons do so also? Um, not that we've noticed. Um, not the sea dragons. No, I mean, no. Like we've had, mul we have multiple males of females in our breeding tanks. And I mean, I don't know whether they, mon I doubt they're monogamous. Um, so, mm -hmm. but we don't, we don't put tabs on them, so we just let them go. Uh, but certainly within one tank in mating season, you can have three or four pairs um, doing the, the tail curling and the um, the mirroring, as it's called, yeah. um, at the same time. And you can eat, even the young animals now, um, which are not a breeding age, are starting to do it in the tanks within yeah. within those tanks. So yeah. And do you have? The, I'm just curious uh, if. Do you have any videos of the mirroring on your um, page? Um, look, I probably do. I've got more, yeah, I've probably got more photos of seahorses and sea dragons on my phone than my family. So, <laughs> um, um, so yeah, look, um, 
I've got my GoPro up and running yeah. too. So that's something yeah. I, I aim to kind of do over the next few months as well is um, potentially get some yeah. good footage of, you know, you've got to catch it at the right moment though. So I'll try and have it on hand so I can get some videos. Yeah. And, like I, yeah, and, and we, we try and post a fair bit on our Facebook page, just, but I've been a bit slack lately just with, with other things. We've been a bit busy, but um, yeah, I'll go back through and if I have any videos of uh, courtship and, um, and we've even got some videos there of the leafies courting as well before they bred. So, um, unfortunately, like I say, unfortunately, it wasn't successful. So, um, we'll um, attempt to yeah be a little bit more. Uh, and if oh, we don't, I'm, just I, a prompt. I'm not giving you a hard time. You guys are doing amazing things. I'm just you know. No, 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 no. I mean, it's, it's good to have it, the feedback and um, you know. Um, as you post, I want to share. Yeah. So that's hey. good. Yeah. In case it dies, two two last questions. I see yours, Gallo. I'm going to ask yours in a moment. But when I kept, uh, I tried to keep ghost pipefish, which I know that's not what you're doing. But um, one of the difficulties was when I received it, the fin was damaged. And so with the leafy dragons, I'm just curious, is it really important to make sure that there's nothing to snag their appendages? Because um, Yeah, look, I mean, we, we just use... Um, the plants that Deborah's got are probably their sort of public aquarium type plants, but I mean, we just keep, um, we just use plastic plants and ours and yeah, certainly um, we did have a, we have had a dragon because when they're smaller, we cover, because our tanks are bigger, we cover our outlets um, with this stuff here and um, it's like a netting and um, they can uh, we used the wider netting at one stage and um plug it into the thing. Hang on, we found a charger. Oh I yay! Won't <laughs> I won't be able to walk too far because it's plugged into the wall. It's okay. Um, um so yeah, uh, that's certainly um stuff without sharp edges and um that's good. Um I mean obviously all of our tanks are round, um, but they don't seem to have any problems adapting to glass tanks. Oh. And um yeah, I know. I love yeah. what um, Alyssa has done a, a great job with them, Colby, and then Alyssa. Um, and I can't wait mm. to talk to Deborah and learn more and get some pictures from her. Um, no. So Gallo wants to know: Are there any seahorse pipe fish? I'm going to throw dragon breeders that ship to Puerto Rico. Do you guys ship to Puerto Rico? Puerto Rico. Um, <laughs> again, um, we only ship to LA, and then within, um, I'm not sure how the flights to Puerto Rico work. I mean, I'm sure there's flights from LA to Puerto Rico, um, how they get there. That's that's something that um, you're, best, you're best talking to a freight forwarder or uh, Michael Foley at Global Animal Transport based in LA. Um, they're obviously, we prefer to use them because they've got experience with animals and they always, um, they know the requirements. So they, they go that extra mile. That's because that's all they do. They just look after animals. Um, and they're the, probably the best people to talk to. I can't really comment on sure. what what and what isn't available domestically within the US, but certainly not internationally from here, obviously, because at the moment um, from Australia, I think we're only flying into LA and maybe San Francisco. I think that's about it. Gotcha. Um, Holly, Cheryl, any questions from you guys as I'm peeking at the comments? No, I just think it's been great. Oh, Thank you so much. No, you're, everyone's welcome. Yeah, no, it's all good. Cheryl? So. Uh, I was just curious because we had a discussion last week about CITES. And yes. are, are they, I'm curious as to whether they gave you guys a hard time when you try to export. Um, no, it's funny. That's actually become easy. So we, similar here, we have state authorities and then we have federal authorities. So for us to collect the animals and breed the animals, they're all state-based permits. To export, we need federal permits. So what we have to do is we have to prove to the federal government that we are a sustainable um, entity. Um, and then um, based upon that, they give us export permits. Um, now that's called, uh, we have to become what's called a recognized, what do we, um, we have to have a, Wildlife Trade Authority, a w, oh, sorry, WTO, wildlife trade, a recognized wildlife trade operation. So within that, yeah, so that um, comes up every three years. Um, 
But what's happened in the last 12 months is our operation has been recognised that we've been doing it so long that um, uh, we don't have to we don't have to get that WTO anymore from the federal government. Um, so we don't actually to we still, we still have to have societies for uh, seahorses certainly, but we don't require any native wildlife permits now to export to the US and that with the dragons because they are not CITES listed. Um, so it's actually become easier. The hardest part was getting US Fish and Wildlife to accept that fact. Um, it took well, a while. Um, they talked about that last them. week. We we had on Dr. Sarah Foster and, and Dan is a US breeder of seahorses and they really talked deeply about how fish and wildlife management is, is maybe yeah. the, the catch. Yeah, right, Cheryl. They're, they're not yeah. trained to, to do what they're trying to do, and they don't have. Therefore, they they do not recognize what they're looking at. And well, I think this is part of the problem. I mean, it's it's there's not a deep understanding, I think, of a lot of what goes on. I mean, certainly there is. You know, they're there for a reason, and they do a good job. Um, mm -hmm. But sometimes, um, like to say, to get the clearances when we were actually sending, when we got told them that we don't have to send, and we didn't have to send. The US Fish and Wildlife, our Fish and Wildlife, or Environment and Heritage Department here sent a letter to the US Fish and Wildlife Department in Washington. Then they disseminated that information to all the ports of entry um, because uh, it had to go that far um, to get it established that what we were doing, what we were saying was correct because no regional office would accept what we were saying. Um, we had to go to the top and get them to go to the top and then disseminate down. Um, so, I mean, that's bureaucracy, unfortunately, at its best. Yeah. Absolutely. It, it sounds like it's still not, not where it needs to be with a lot of these agencies. Um, yeah, look, I mean, now it's been established. That's good. I mean, um, and I mean, even if they do go CITES listing, um, we, um, it's unlikely that dragons will go CITES anytime soon. I don't think there's... I mean, where we dive for our leafy um, uh, stock is extremely remote. We're allowed to dive an 800 kilometre sec section of coastline that is basically left alone because there's a lot of um, a lot of activity in that area with um, shark activity and not small ones, uh, big ones. Um, so it's very and it's very underpopulated and. Just no one goes there, and we've we've dived and seen thirty dragons in a day, thirty leafies in a day. Wow. So there's still a healthy population there, and mm -hmm. um, our permit allows us to take two per year. So I don't think we're in any way detrimental to the population at those low numbers. And hopefully from that, um, yeah, let's say we can get a breeding uh, in the next two years. We can because uh, it'll take two years for our own young that we raise here to develop. Um, but there's been quite a bit of gene studies done too by San Diego, um, by Scripps and that on the weedies and leafies recently with genetic, uh, what do they call it? Genetic genome. Mm. I know it's a big word that I can't pronounce. Genome. <laughs> big word that I can't pronounce. Yeah. Um, but any, but basically what's happened is it, there's four, they're recognizing four distinct groups of weedies, uh, the Sydney population, the Victorian population, the Tasmanian population and, and everywhere else. Um, so that's bringing in some challenges um, that they're saying that the Victorian population should be managed separately to everyone else. Um, not so much what we're doing, but um, Melbourne's a city of uh, 5 million people basically on the doorstep of where the weedies live. So there needs to be some management of activities and probably marine parks set up and stuff like that, because there has been some um, infrastructure projects in the past that have interfered with the weedies, particularly within Port Phillip Bay, which is the big bay, if you look at Melbourne, that Melbourne, we all live around. Um, so hopefully that type of thing will, will come in, but it'll all be um, well managed and well thought out. With the, the habitat. Stakeholders being involved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and all the stakeholders being involved, yeah. us being one of them, um, so that we don't just get blindsided by a, a law saying that suddenly we can't collect. Um, so, sure. Yeah, fisheries are very happy with yeah. us. Um, we get inspected regularly by our local fisheries officers, and um, as one of the the big fisheries officers here, as he came in here, he said, "This our facility is a definition of sustainability." Oh, nice. Uh, so so awesome. it's quite a good um, 
statement that I've held on to. Um, so that because you you know we we've got four hundred animals for four animals that we've taken from the wild. So that's amazing. Just to repeat that, you yeah. said you took four from the wild and you have four hundred from that. Well, over over a period of two years, from four right. miles. Right. I mean, but still, it's awesome. Yeah. So when over two years, yeah. With a collection, I know I asked about the fins earlier, and it's or not fins, appendages. I should have said, but um, is collection? Do you do you just use? I I don't want to know your secrets. I promise. But do you just use like nets? What does collection look like? No, no, we don't. We don't use nets at all. Basically, we just we go down with big plastic bags, and we just overbag the animal, and um, we um, we'll collect an animal, but we won't take the first animal we see like you say we're looking for specific things like the age of the eggs the number of eggs um the condition of the the parent um and things like that so um we may look at 10 animals before we decide to take one that we, we think is suitable and um then we overbag the animal like so it's a big bag it's got about 30 liters of water in it and um then we swim back to uh we generally catch them in six to eight meters. We'll slowly swim back to about two meters. Um, and then we, we, we have what we call them eskies. I think you call them um, ice boxes. Okay. Um, like a big cooler. Yeah. Um, yeah. The animal gets put in that uh, with another bag of water beside it to keep it cool. And from there back to our facility is about 20 minutes. Oh. Um, so that's a good one. When we um, but we do the leafies in exactly the same way, except the cooler we bring them home and it holds a thousand litres of water. And um, we drive about 36 to 40 hours straight back with stops for checking the animals on the way. Wow. So they, I mean, they, they do well um, for sh like shipping in general. Uh, look, yeah, I mean, we, we do lose the odd animal. We, we have to admit sure. that. And um, there's, um but yeah i think this year we even like i was saying before those animals that we sent to st louis that got missed their connection um the animals are, are fine so it's very rare that we do lose an animal um but it does happen but it's generally um due to some sort of freight mishandling or yeah. um when we did animals to kentucky um someone took a photo of the boxes and sent to me that, and the boxes have been absolutely destroyed. Oh. Um, you can actually see the animals through the side of the box um, mm. and the animals all survive. So yeah. that's terrible. And I, and I was, I, you already covered that earlier. I was more thinking of like even car ride transportation. I should have said transportation, not shipping, sorry. But I mean, it seems like they're not as, as, as delicate as, as many people might think. And you've already Look, covered the fact are, that they're yeah, not they're in danger. There, I mean, there's a lot of misconception. I mean, you go onto websites and probably not so much now because of Facebook, a lot of the websites have sort of died a bit, but you know, that people mention sea dragons and people come up and say, oh, it's illegal, it's this, it's that. Um, and you sort of go in there, well, um, go to the horse's mouth, which is right. myself or someone in Australia and you get the facts and um, we'll, we won't tell you what you want to hear. What we'll tell you is what we think is the truth. and um and from that you know you can decide if you do want to keep animals um whether they are or aren't for you but um obviously post us letting you have the animals it's out of our control and um we certainly if an animal arrives dead we will replace it but um the requirements are there they're not they're not super difficult to keep i think i'd be more concerned about keeping some of these high-end tropical fish that come out like the peppermint angels and stuff Right. Um, but, um, you know, if I could afford to spend 30,000 on one fish, that would be nice. Right. Um, <laughs> but, um, I just, I, I want to yeah. say, I think it's absolutely amazing that you take the time to make sure that new customers, uh, like if an individual tried to buy one, buy them, um, that you care and you make sure that you, you require them to tell you that they can take care of them. I think that's yeah. awesome. So well, good. Yeah. Well, I mean, and. I mean, and to be honest, I mean, it's like Deborah, I sort of keep bringing Deborah up, which is no, she's, she's, she's one great. of the few that's taken on the challenge and, and met it head on. Um, is um, her setup would be better than a lot of public aquarium setups. I mean, I don't know whether you've seen her filtration room and how much time and effort she's gone into designing and working out, I mean, um, what the animals need. Um, and it's, um, 
you know, she's got the the best of the best, that's for sure. But she's put, put a lot of effort into it, thought about, excuse me, and she's had very good success. I think she's had the animals coming up three years now. And Sorry. Never had any major issues. Um, so, yeah, it's certainly doable. Um, and, and Alicia's had, I mean, those animals that Colby had and Alicia has now uh, probably at least four years old, I think. I'd have to go back. I think we exported them 2016 or 17, so... I still have footage Colby sent me of them, and I know that uh, she has done a great job too. Um, see, we're savvy guys. That's who we were talking about. Yeah. And uh, Cheryl, did you have a question? Because I had one more about Fry. But go ahead. No, I was just I was thinking back as soon as you said Colby, I knew where they came from. Yep. Yep. Dan was kind of in on that too, and uh, mm -hmm. they went to the right place, and they're doing. I mean, I, I, she's doing a great job with them, and. The fact that they're do thriving says a lot about where they came from, you know. You. Yeah, yeah. So and with they, the, I mean, they're one hundred percent on frozen, so that's good. That's that's the key, I think, and and I understand that it's more difficult and more expensive. But if I were to buy some, I think I would do the frozen because that just seems like for uh, someone that's landlocked, well, I, can, I can't get live all the time. Yeah, well, I was going to say. I mean, um, obviously, a lot of public aquariums. Yes. I mean, actually getting live mice, it's, um, I know the local aquarium here spends several hundred dollars a week. And Sean Garner from uh, Florida Aquarium, who have some of our leafies and weedies, um, sort of indicated to me once how much they spend on food. And I mean, they get their food quite locally from U.S. mice. It's, um, in, uh, U.S. mice the, actually came on Wine Wednesday like three weeks ago. He's amazing. Yeah, Go ahead. Uh, Sorry. Is it, uh, Herb, is it? Yes. Herb? Yes. Herb. And yeah, we, no, we no. promote him. Herb. Go ahead. Yeah, no, no, I know Herb's a good guy. I've met Herb a couple of times in the US, um, once in Tampa and once in, oh, sorry, actually three times, once in Tampa, once in Atlanta and once in San Diego. So, um, yeah, so we've, um, I mean, we've been to a couple of conferences over there. Um, there was supposed to be another SIG bio conference this month, uh, sorry, May, but uh, there's no way I'll be going to China at the moment. Right. Um, just, I wanted uh, to go too, but yeah. <laughs> No, it's just he's, not he's the right the only, time, unfortunately. No. He's the only source I know that truly has affordable live mice and shrimp. Yes. He, yeah. Herb is amazing. Yeah, uh, I mean, we're used to supply mice, but our own needs are so great now. It's just, we just haven't got the time to dedicate. Pang, and plus Pang, the other guy who does the sea dragons here, he does it and it's like his business and I'm not going to encroach on his business that he's been doing for a long, long time. It's not necessary, uh, so... I think that's awesome. Just shows more of your, um, I'm so sorry about the background noise guys. It's my, it's my road. I can't help it. Crazy cars anyways, but no, I just think that's awesome. Marina said that your tanks and your uh, animals are so beautiful fish, excuse me. Um, and Dylan's little hobby asked, are sea dragons ever found in the open sea or are they always near grasslands? Uh, they not open open sea no um so the deepest i've found them is probably 25 meters um diving for leafies in western australia um but we wouldn't take them that deep because it's just too much trouble to equalize them it's, the process is too long um but yeah generally they live closer to the coast in um areas where um it's very grassy very kelpy that type of thing Gotcha. And so with the um, decompression or whatever you call it, um, when, when you're bringing them up, how long does that actually take to make sure there's no problems? Um, it depends on the animal um, and where we catch them. Um, it can take up to eight hours, um, even catching them, you know, sort of quite shallow, um, just bringing them up very slowly. Mm. Um, we don't, um, and I mean, there are, uh, particularly leafies are quite susceptible to gulping oxygen and giving themselves so they're positively buoyant. And um, Koji Wada, who uh, owns Blue Harbour in um, Osaka, Japan, he got, there was a, an animal that did that, a leafy that did that at um, Osaka Aquarium. And he went and found himself a um, decompression chamber. Um, and he put the animal in there for three days and like it's just like he, as you would a human he took it down to like 20 meters and watered it out over three days they managed to get the steam compression chamber that the japanese have designed they were able to put food in um and it's sim similar to what they use a lot of the, the like brian green and a few other the really deep collectors who work out of hawaii and 
um, that they use these decompression chambers that they take down to hundreds of meters and they bring the fish up. Um, similar vein, so, and it worked. So it's, um, we've tried many things um, and it actually gets talked about quite a bit in that um, article I mentioned before that was done by Dr. Rob Jones and Melbourne Sea Life. Um, Which we will try to link uh, when we're done for sure. Yeah. Amy, uh, I did forget to say it because I was so excited to have um, him on, Steve on, but uh, Chardonnay tonight. I was trying to take it easy, make sure my questions stayed focused, right? Um, but yeah, eight hours. He's talked, if you go back and watch the whole thing, he's talked a lot about how collection is serious and the reason that he's one of the few people permitted to do so is because his facility is approved and because he knows the tricks to collection and to care. Um, and he's doing great things for us in the hobby and in the industry, um, public aquariums, by training them to frozen and so many other things. You got to watch the whole thing. But Steve, I was curious, are there any other, um, like, for instance, I had completely forgotten. I knew it. I'd written an article about it, but I forgot there was a third sea dragon species and there are so many seahorse species. Yeah. So are there any others that, you want to work with? Well, I mean, obviously the, the ruby, I think is, it's found very deep. Um, uh, when I recorded right. it was 55 meters, which is about 150 feet, which is diveable, but I mean, just, and plus there's so few of them. And I mean, there's some things that I think should just be left so alone. Wild. Um, and I think there's one of them, obviously there's the, uh, ribbon sea dragon, which is actually a pike fish, um, or the dampier sea dragon, they call it. It's one that, that we were talking about before that, uh, we've done a bit of work with Paula from Dallas World Aquarium in the past. Um, they're probably the only species that we'll work with uh, sort of sea dragon. And then pipefish, the ones that we've shown you, we're also uh, looking at banded pipefish. Um, we we got some that were imported from the Philippines, but um, unfortunately out of three, we've only got one left. Um, we just, just they just didn't seem to do well. So um, I've got a friend who's a collector in Cairns. He's gonna get me some from up there so we can trace the lineage a little bit better okay. uh, and know that perhaps they haven't been caught in a way that's detrimental to their health right um and um so that's about it really i think if we try and put our fingers in too many pies we we, we start losing focus of um um you know we talked we talked about going into doing coral aquaculture and stuff like that but um you know i think it's we'll stick with uh, what we know and uh just keep on the way and hopefully yeah just as each year goes by we get a little bit better at what we do and the successes are a bit better and the the end goal is like we've discussed is to perhaps have everything in house and maybe every two to three years we take one male from the wild that's grabbed because it gives you the best chance of getting progeny and we use that as to keep our genetic diversity up and um yeah that was really interesting about the f1 f2 and what's what's uh allowed to ship but but yeah, no, I just have to say, please do stick with it because I do understand that as a business, you have to, um, you know, diversify and do different things, but you guys are making such a huge difference. Like you're one of the only people that are doing this, not, not just collecting, but breeding. So we just so appreciate you. Hey, happy birthday, Mermaid's Reef. Just had to shout that out. Sorry. Um, but okay, guys. Uh, I've kept Steve for two hours now after he has worked all night and, and been going with us for two hours now. So he's always available to answer questions. I will post links that we've talked about during the stream in the description when we're done. Definitely check out o Ocean Reef Aquaculture. Cheryl, Holly, or anyone in the comments, last chance for questions. Or Steve, is there anything else I didn't cover that you wanted to uh, share? No, look, I think we pretty much covered it, like you say, and I'm... Um... I am going to have to call it quits because I've actually got another appointment that I have to get to. No problem. And um, so, um, but yeah, no. And so like questions through the Facebook page, if anyone comes up and thinks of something that they've, um, they think of later, um, yes. yeah, for the time being, just go through the Facebook page and um, you can on the messenger service there and that's fine. And uh, yeah, we'll just, um, obviously try and answer your questions and yep. Yeah. And thanks for having us. Hey, we appreciate you so much. Tell Justine I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I, I need her to come and talk in women and reefing. I'll talk to you a little bit later. Get to your appointment. We really appreciate your work you. and you coming tonight. Thank you so much, Steve. Okay, no worries. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you. Okay, chat soon. Bye bye.
Okay, guys, so for the stream, I'm going to go ahead and call that, too. I have to talk to Holly on the side. Holly, do you want to really quickly show your drink and uh, a beautiful tank in the background and anything you want to share real quick? The grow-out tank there. And some Guinness. <laughs> what happened to the green beer? She had green beer at first, guys. Yeah, this is Irish beer, so <laughs> this is the stout. So. Okay, we're good. It's called the Wicked Leprechaun. Wait a minute, she was breaking up. What's it called? It's called a Wicked Little Leprechaun. Oh. And what it is, it's a shot of vodka, a shot of Curacao, a splash of 7-Up, and orange juice. Oh, that sounds good. Oh, I bet it's I would love it. It's delicious. <laughs> hey, hey, final thing. Um, can you show us your hat? Uh, not, it's not a hat. It's a headband. <laughs> can, yes. The lights are so oh, dim. <laughs> lighting. Here we go. There we go. She's She's got oh. shamrocks all over. <laughs> Happy St. Patrick's Day. Happy St. Patty's. <laughs> Okay, anything else you guys need to say live? Because uh, I know I have to talk to Holly off, off, not live. You good? <laughs> no, okay, good. well then I'm going to say everyone, thank you so much for coming. We thank Steve again. Sorry again for keeping you so long, but we appreciate all the information. I'll give you a bunch of links in the comments when we're done. And I'm going to say happy Wine Wednesday. Ladies, say goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. Cheers.